thanks to Tobias Pfaff and Alvaro Sanchez, I will present our work on learning mesh-based simulations with graph networks. We believe simulation is fundamental to science and technology. As a matter of fact, the world's largest supercomputer was built for simulation. In 2019, it was used across 19 different applications, from molecular simulation to astrophysics. Actually, nine out of the 10 world's largest supercomputers were built for simulation purposes. And if you wonder about the remaining one, that was built for AI. This speaks to the importance of simulation for scientific computing. Mesh-based finite element methods are the number one tool for simulations. The formations as seen on the bridge on the left are very inconvenient to express over fixed grids. While on meshes, we have powerful methods for integrating, solving PDEs, and computing deformations. I want to highlight the importance of meshes and adaptivity for optimal usage of resource budget. We can easily adapt the mesh resolution according to the scale and complexity of the dynamics in different regions. In this airfoil example, the domain is 40 meters wide, but we have accuracy of 0.2 millimeters around the wingtip. This mesh has only 5,000 nodes, while a uniform grid would require 40 billion nodes to have this precision. Despite the modeling advantages, meshes are rarely used as a representation in machine learning. In this work, we use mesh representation to learn to simulate complex scenes, modeling collision and contact accurately, which is very challenging with mesh-free methods. These videos show example rollouts of our model for different physical systems. The predictions remain stable and accurate for hundreds of time steps. Additionally, our model is 10 to 200 times faster than the ground truth simulation. Now, I'll pass it to Alvaro, who will explain the basic of the model's architecture. Thanks, Mary. Um, our model for meshes, built on our previous graph network simulator model for particle systems, accepted at ICML last year. This model worked by building a nearest neighbor graph and then running multiple steps of message passing in that graph. The model worked extremely well for simulations of fluids and granular materials, but not so well for things like elastics. So our new model extends the previous one to work with meshes. Like our previous model, it follows an encode process decode approach. Let's look at this example of a cloth interacting with a sphere. The encoder builds the input graph representing the state of the cloth and the sphere. In this case, the state is already in a mess, which is essentially already a graph with nodes and, with nodes and edges. However, the mess edges alone may not be optimal for message passing. For example, in the mesh representing the piece of cloth, there may be two points that are quite far apart when the cloth is flat, but may come into contact during the course of a simulation. Modeling this contact via the messages could be very inefficient. Similarly, the mesh corresponding to the sphere is not even connected to the cloth mesh. So it would be impossible for the graph net to model the interaction between the two. Instead, we give our model capabilities to reason both in world space and in mesh space. First, we include both the world space and mesh space relative positions between pairs of nodes as edge features of the mesh edges. Um, but we also add additional world space edges based on spatial proximity with relative world space position as features. These world space edges will allow the model to learn about compact contact very efficiently, including self collisions of the cloth. Finally, we add any remaining features, for example, the velocity of the nodes to fully specify the state. Crucially, like in our previous work, we do not add absolute node positions as node features. Instead, the relative positional features in the edges make the model fully local and translational equivariant, which is key for data efficiency and generalization to larger scenes. After encoding the node and edge features, the processor performs several rounds of message passing. In each round, each node pulls messages coming from both mesh space edges in gray and world space edges in red. This now better reflects the real physical interactions which may be contact interactions in world space on interactions via the mesh. Finally, the decoder extracts the acceleration for each particle of the mesh, which is used to update the state of the mesh with an Euler integrator. 
We train this model on one-step data using pairs of inputs and target states, and then have it generalized to rollouts of thousands of steps at test time. Similarly to our previous work, we add small amounts of Gaussian noise to the inputs during training, which teaches the model to compensate for errors in the inputs and improves rollout stability. Finally, in the case of meshes, many simulators use dynamic remeshing to dynamically adapt the resolution of the mesh to different parts of the simulation. One approach is to specify a sizing field that indicates the required resolution for each region of the simulation. In this case, we also have our model to predict this sizing field and recompute the mesh according to the sizing field at each step. I will now leave you with Toby, who will explain the results. Thanks, Alvaro. Let's look at what you can do with this model. A nice advantage of our model is that it's very versatile. In our previous work, we predicted the acceleration of discrete particles. And in fact, we can still do that, as mesh graph nets is a generalization of our previous work. But now we can also predict arbitrary continuous quantities sampled on meshes. And to model all of these very different systems, we use the exact same model. The only difference is what quantities we encode and how we interpret the per node output of our model. Let's look at some rollouts. We stay accurate and stable in all of them, with low error rates and inference times 10 to 200 times faster than the ground truth simulator. Here's a rendering of 2D incompressible flow around the cylinder, and the graph nodes are just samples of the continuous velocity and pressure fields. And the per node output represents temporal change of those fields at the mesh nodes. Here we have compressible flow around the cross section of an airfoil uh, with continuous velocity, density, and pressure fields. And you can see our model correctly captures shock and vortex shedding. Next, we learn to simulate class dynamics on a moving dynamic mesh where inputs and outputs are 3D positions and acceleration, respectively. And this is using learned remeshing. But the mesh doesn't necessarily have to be a triangle mesh. It could also be a volumetric tetrahedral mesh, as in this bending plate example. The method doesn't actually care that this is a tetrahedral mesh, or really that it is a quasi-static, not an inertial simulation. We just encode node position, decode position change, and that's it. The model architecture for all of these examples is exactly the same. Next, let's look at learned remeshing. In the bottom, you can see the sizing field that Alvaro introduced earlier. As folds and bends propagate to the cloth, the sizing field adapts to give more resolution to areas where it is needed. And here we have a comparison, ground truth on the left, learned dynamics with ground truth meshing in the middle, and learned everything on the right. And you can see that all of these show very plausible dynamics. In the paper, we also compare to several baselines, mesh-free methods, grid-based methods, and other graph architectures. And we beat all of these baselines in accuracy. But it's worth taking a closer look to as why that is. And so we highlight one of these examples here. So here we compare to GNS, our previous mesh-free model, which only operates in world space. And this rollout quickly becomes unstable, and the error goes to the roof. The reason for this is that GNS can't properly evaluate deformation because of the lack of mesh space information. And hence, it can't compute elasticity very well. To contrast this here with mesh graph nets, our new model on the same setup. And we can roll it out basically indefinitely long without losing stability. Now, this is a rollout of 40,000 steps, which is 100 times longer than the sequence it was trained on. And more insights and comparisons like this can be found in our paper. The final thing I want to highlight is generalization. We use a model trained on the flag shown earlier. And our model has no trouble generalizing to this windsock with tassels, even though it's only ever seen a rectangular flag in training. This mesh is also much bigger than a training mesh with 10 times as many nodes. And you can see the learned remeshing adding and removing nodes during rollout. And we can see the training domain for comparison below. And this is a very nice result, actually, because what it means is that we don't need to uh, run expensive simulations to generate training data. We can train on cheap low-res data, and in a test time, run a much more complex high-res setup using the fast inference of our model. Let's look at some areas of future research. Now, currently, we only train our remeshing model on the input mesh distribution. And one exciting addition would be to directly optimize the meshing for prediction performance or a downstream task. You could also think about how to make good use of this type of model beyond prediction, 
for example, in design optimization. And of course, learned simulators would be even more useful if you could directly learn from real-world data. So in conclusion, I hope I convinced you that both mesh representations and graph nets are awesome. And together, they bring some very desirable properties to learned simulators. We are very much looking forward to more research and adaptivity and are curious to see how far these type of models can be scaled up to. I've put the links to paper and video in the corner so you can have a look at the full results. Thank you.